This module provides a hands-on demonstration for performing vehicle fastest fast speed checks at roundabouts. Refer also to part one of this module for additional overview information. For this demonstration, we'll be walking through the steps for developing fastest pass speed checks for the single lane entries and exits north-south and two lane entries and exits east-west for this partial multi-lane roundabout. This design was developed and submitted for peer review. So we're gonna use this opportunity to walk through the steps of how we would check this uh, design independently to verify that it meets the speed control objective set out by GDOT or whether additional modifications to the design might be needed to further improve speed control. To check the fastest paths, we're going to use beast lines to represent the center line of the vehicle as it navigates through the roundabout, through those curves through the roundabout. We want to make sure that the center line of the vehicle is at least five feet away from any curb faces and three feet away from painted edge lines. To, to set that up for preparing our beast blinds, we're going to set a series of offset construction lines through the roundabout. We're going to start out looking at this northbound approach. And at the beginning of the project, we're actually adjacent to a lane line. We have a little bit of distance between the entry and the exit with some gore striping. So we're actually going to use our three foot offset here rather than a five foot. We would use a five foot offset if we were in a situation like this where we had a double yellow line with uh, bi-directional traffic directly adjacent to each other. But as we get up into this area with the painted edge line, we're going to use a three foot offset. As they get within the curved areas, we're going to switch over to a five foot offset from any curb face. So we have five foot offset there. On the outside, we have a painted edge line, an edge of gutter pan, a face of curb, and a back of curb. I want to make sure that we're using the five foot offset from the face of curb, from the vertical element. A lot of times we'll see uh, designers offset the incorrect line, they'll offset the edge of pavement or the edge of the gutter pan. And that's going to end up resulting in a slower predicted speed that's not going to reflect the true fastest path. So we're going to continue along offsetting our curb faces. As we get to the central island, we have no gutter pan here, so we got to be careful we're grabbing the correct line. We have a mountable curb type, so we have a back of curb and face of curb, so we're going to offset the face of curb five feet. And then we'll again offset face of curb five feet along all of these elements through the exit. As we get beyond the splitter island and get to the edge of the project, we are back to a painted double yellow center line. So we're going to offset that five feet on each side. And then here adjacent to this uh, painted edge line, we're going to use a three foot offset. And this is not likely to be the portion that is going to be controlling our curve. We're going to go ahead and place it in there as just a guideline to make sure that our curve doesn't end up getting any closer than that. I'm also going to extend out this line a little bit further to give us a little bit more room for constructing our fastest path. We don't know what exactly is beyond the limits of construction here, but we do see we have a tangent coming in um, that we're tying into. And so we're going to assume for this demonstration that that tangent continues just a little bit further beyond the intersection. The next step before we get into developing our B splines is we want to set a couple other reference points to use to make sure that we're getting the start and end points of the B spline far enough from the roundabout. We want to use a 165 foot offset at both the start and the end to make sure that we're getting the start and end points far enough back. So those are going to be a guideline for us in establishing our B spline. The next step is going to be putting the B spline uh, through those offset points. So for that, we're going to use curves by points. The dialog box here shows that there's 
a few different methods possible. GDOT allows both control points or through points as acceptable methods for developing the beast lines. The illustrations in the GDOT guide show control points um, in <clears throat> each of those illustrations. So for this demonstration, we're going to utilize through points to illustrate how that process works. I'm going to quickly show you the difference between control points and through points. So for a control points, if I draw the B spline, every time I click my mouse, it's creating an inflection point that the spiral curve is being fit through. Each of those inflection points you can grab as a handle and pull it around and manipulate the spline curve path. But notice that the handle is at the vertex of the curve. It's not on the curve itself. That compares to the through points method. I'll draw a similar path. Where the point is actually on the line itself as you're going through the spline curve. Same, same idea. Every point you click creates an inflection point that the spline is being fed through. And so adjusting any of those points adjusts the shape of the spline. But it's actually on the path. What's helpful about the through points is that these points can be snapped to your offset lines a little bit easier for some more control as you're going through and laying it out through the roundabout. The nice part about control points is that you can be able to use these lines to manipulate the path and make sure that your center of your arc is roughly perpendicular to the curb face. Um, so there is some benefits to each methodology, but both will give you acceptable results and either are um, acceptable options. But for this, we're going to use the through points method as the method for this demonstration. We're going to use our nearest snap and we're going to set three points upstream of our 165 foot offset line to start our path. We're then going to place one point near the entry along the outside curb line. We're going to set one point along the central island, one point along the outside curb line through the exit, and then we're going to set three points downstream of our offset line through the exit. Once we have those in place, and I didn't use a lot of precision there to lay them out, it's, again, we have the ability to adjust the paths using those handles. So once we get those laid in there, the next step is going to be to come through and make adjustments to the path to make sure that we are meeting our minimum offsets along the entirety of the path. So I can grab the handle through the entry and shift it around until I'm just barely touching that offset line at one point, but staying staying on the right side of it, so I'm maintaining that five feet offset along the entirety of the path. It looks like we're pretty close there. Down here, we maintained our three foot offset along this length line, and then we maintained that same minimum offset because the curb face was a little further when we first started getting into the curb section here. We'll adjust the path slightly at this point to make sure that we're maintaining our five foot offset along the central island at all points. And through the exit, we're going to need to move this point down just a little bit to make sure that we're Make sure we're staying off of the offset line all the way through. And then as we get to the end of the path, again, we're going to be making sure that that is approximately 165 feet or more away from the roundabout. 
um, to make sure that we're getting a nice flat path coming out. So the three foot offset didn't really apply adjacent to this painted lane line. You can tell that the controlling point was the five foot offset from the double yellow center line and then along the edge of the curb face throughout the exit. When laying out this, these fastest paths, you wanna make sure that you're getting a good 25 to 50 feet of distance between each of the points on the entry. The use of three points is really to help make sure that you have a tangent established going into the path before you get to that first curve. And so that you're replicating the trajectory of the vehicle along that straight path. And then the curvature that's feeding into the entry of the roundabout isn't being manipulated by just one point at the end. So having three points at the end is really important. The other really important part of this procedure is only having one point along the entry, one point circulating, and one point along the exit on the outside curb line. These points are what are influencing um, the curvature of this spline curve. This is Central Island is pushing the spline curve towards the east while the entry and the exit are pushing the spline curve towards the west. If we put more points in there, it's actually gonna artificially influence the radius of the spline curve along the path. And so we wanna make sure that it's the geometry that's dictating it and not us artificially influencing it with additional points. So having one point at each of these three points is pretty critical to the overall procedure. And then having the three points at either end to establish a tangent and having them spaced out far enough that you're getting a good tangent is, uh, is also important. So that's the development of the basic fastest path spline through a single lane entry. Next, we're gonna demonstrate the layout of a fastest path for the two lane entry. We're gonna use the eastbound approach through the roundabout and through the two lane exit. For this, we're going to be using the same process. So I've got five foot offsets from all the curb faces already laid out here. We have a divided median, so we're using five foot offsets for the entirety of this path. So we're gonna go ahead with laying out our curve and we'll use a curve by points and we'll lay out three points upstream of our 165 foot construction line. We'll lay out one point along the outside curb line, one point along the edge of the central island, one point along the outside curb line on the exit, and then three points along the median along the exit to complete our path. So we're coming in, we'll make our adjustments to the path like we did with the other northbound fastest path. You can see that we'll need to adjust the positioning of the point there to make sure that we're um, staying within our offset lines. One thing that we always wanna just keep in mind is that we've got a nice smooth path through the entry that's reflecting that fastest path the driver might take. If we start the path too close to the roundabout, let's say we moved this these points up closer just for illustration purposes. You can see how that creates this artificial kink in the path. We could be able to move this down a little bit, but still we end up with this artificial kink in the path. That's gonna suggest a very small radius on the entry, but it's not a very likely path that a driver would take, and it's not reflecting the actual fastest speed that a driver could take. So that's really what we're trying to look out for as we're laying these out, that we avoid those kinks, that we have a nice smooth path and that we've got something that's reflecting that fastest line that a driver would likely take as they go through the roundabout. Now, if we were to move these points even further back, there is a, there is a point where you're getting too far back from the intersection. And you'll actually see how, when I move those three points back, the line jumps to the inside of our offset line there. And what's happening is, is the three points that you have dictated within the roundabout are, are influencing, this, influencing this curve. And so that's suggesting to us that we actually are starting too far back from the intersection and that we're not necessarily reflecting the fastest path that would be dictated by the geometry either. So we'll move these back closer again, but that's a good way that you can kind of test and see um, 
whether you've got the path too close or too far away by being able to look and look for kinks, but then also make sure that your path is within the uh, offsets from the curb faces. So we'll make one more quick adjustment here. And then we've got an adjustment to the Central Island location. Quick adjustment to the exit location. And then on the exit here, we've got a nice smooth curve. You can see how we've got the trajectory of the vehicle pushing towards the outside curb line as it goes around the roundabout. And then that's going to push the vehicle as their momentum carries them forward back towards the median. So we have a nice smooth curve there. We might be able to stretch this out just a little bit further. In general, looks like we're in pretty good shape there. And I made a small difference, I made a small adjustment to the path, but in general, we're not moving it much at this point. So I think we'll call that good enough and come back here and just make sure that that didn't impact our offset there. All right. So we now have our fastest path for the through movement and we'll take a step back and, and again, just verify that that's a nice smooth path that goes through the intersection. At this point, we can turn off our offsets. The next step is going to be to measure these individual radii through the intersection. And so if we can take an arc tool and we're literally just going to lay an arc on top of our spline curve and I'm using this start and mid command, and that just allows me to kind of dictate the length of my curve, and then I can lay in the middle of the curve here. You can see I'm getting about a 288, you know, close to 290 if I'm rounding up for that curve. But what the key is here is we want to make sure that we're measuring over an appropriate distance. So if we try to measure over too long of a length, let's say I try to measure over this entire length, you can see that we're not quite matching up with the curve. And that's because the spline is a constantly varying spline curve. It's constantly varying radius. Whereas if we measure over too short of a distance, we're not really capturing the effect of the geometry on the speed. We're capturing a point speed and not necessarily the average speed that the driver might be coming through the entry. So that 65 to 80 tends to be a good middle ground to be able to get the effective speed but also be able to still match the curve reasonably. One trick that you can use is to generate a circle with diameter of about 70 feet, and then just snap that along the line. You can kind of slide it along and see if you can use that to kind of find where that tightest point is. And I'm gonna pick there and we'll do an initial test. I'll put my arc down and I'm just going to snap along the arc within, you know, close to that guideline that I just created with the circle. So that gives me a length that's a little over uh, my minimum 65 feet. And I'm getting about a 292 foot radius. Now I can test to see if I actually found the smallest portion of that curve by going a little bit to the left, which that puts me at 313, so that's higher. Or I can go a little bit to the right. I didn't quite get long enough there. Let's try a little further. And that's at 297, 300. So I'm pretty close. I can come in maybe a little bit tighter there, 282. So yeah, I think we need to move our template over just a little bit. And we'll get I think we need to move it a little bit further, it looks like. So that looks like we're getting 280 there. So we'll move, we'll move our template over to match. So we're able to find and use that template to help us uh, as a guide for measuring the length and getting an appropriate length in there. But we want to kind of test along that arc to make sure that we're getting the appropriate um, smallest point along the path. We'll do the same thing, copy our template. We'll do the same thing along the R2, which is the circulating speed. I'm going to pick there and we'll measure that curve. And so I'm getting about 143. I'll test just a little bit to the left, 147, and a little bit to the right, 
that's 146. So the 143 looks like we did find about the tightest spot in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that in. Moving to the exit curves, you'll note that this design has a fairly flat exit geometry, which means that the R3 exit curve ends up being quite a ways away from the circular roadway. Our interest is really in the speeds at the crosswalk and right at the exit. So we're actually gonna look at both of these curves to see which one might be controlling from a geometric standpoint. And then we'll also look at the acceleration from vehicles traveling around the central island to the, over this distance to the crosswalk. So let's first start out and just do some quick tests of the radii at these two locations just to get a sense for what might be controlling. So this one looks like it's around 450. And further downstream here, this looks like it's closer to 600 feet, 625, 650. So this is definitely going to still be controlling in terms of tighter curvature upstream of this crosswalk. This flattens out and allows higher speeds as you get further away. So we're gonna use this as our controlling curve from a geometric standpoint. So we'll go ahead and copy our template and drop. Oops. Drop that in. Place our arc. And we're getting about 460 feet for our radius there. All right. And we'll come in and we'll do some additional checks of the speeds here uh, in a few minutes. So the next thing we can do is take that radius and convert it to a speed. We've got a little Excel file that's been created. This is something that any, uh, any person can do at home in NCHRP report 672, which is available just with a basic internet search. It's available as a free PDF. Um, these are the equation numbers 61 and 62 that will give you these two equations for converting the radius to speed. Or if you look in the appendix of the GDOT roundabout guide, they also have the equation information there that you can be able to use and just create a simple um, Excel table, Excel template to be able to uh, do these calculations. So for our first element here, we had a 280 foot radius. So there are two options that are identified. One is with a positive and one is with a negative super elevation coming in. Typically, roadways are going to be crowned towards the outside curb line for drainage along the outside. Uh, if you have additional drainage information and if you have um, grading already developed for your roundabout, you can follow the grading plan to choose whether you have positive or negative super elevation depending on which direction the, um, the road is sloping but if you're still at the initial conceptual layout stage the general assumption is that you would use a positive super elevation going through the entry since the drainage will be going towards the outside and you'll be curving with the direction of the cross slope so we'll have a 280 foot radius. And so with a positive super elevation, we're gonna end up with a 30 mile an hour entry curve. So kind of right at the upper limit, which is a 30 miles an hour that we would want for this type of two lane entry where you have vehicles crossing uh, multiple lanes. If you had a raised lane divider or other element in here, uh, refer to the GDOT roundabout guide. You're gonna set up your path just a little bit differently in terms of which lane to start with, but a raised curb lane divider is going to restrict those vehicles from being able to cross paths and it's gonna help result in a slower speed as a result. But when, we're, when we have no raised dividers and vehicles are allowed to cross both lanes, um, then we'll end up with this higher speed calculation. And as a result, in this situation, we wanna make sure that they're staying under a, at least 30 miles an hour coming in for, uh, for safety purposes. That slow speed helps to make sure that you have consistent speeds. Typically your uh, circulating speeds are about 15 to 18 miles an hour. And so 
under 30 mile an hour entry speed means that you have a speed differential between entering and circulating traffic of between 12 and 15 miles an hour. It also means that you have slower speeds for being able to come to a full yield if needed to, and to transition those speeds better as you're decelerating into the circulating speed going through the roundabout. So lots of reasons that you want to maintain that slow speed and keep the fastest path speed below 30. If drivers are staying in their own lane, we would expect them to be naturally traveling slower than that. Again, this is reflecting the fastest path, the fastest speed that a driver would theoretically be able to take through the roundabout. So with that, we could then be able to add some annotations here. It's nice just to be able to go through and place a quick note. And so if we label the radius as 280 feet, and we're going to put the speed was equal to 30 miles per hour. And that way we can use this for setting up some of our figures later. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy, just a quick label to be able to uh, remind ourselves what that was. Notice that I didn't try to round this to decimal points. Um, I round it to the nearest um, whole number. Really, it's probably wise to round to the nearest five feet um, when you're doing some of the fastest paths. There's, a, there's an inherent subjectivity in terms of where you've placed these points along the spline curve and, and some inherent error in the precision in, me in measuring. Um, so there's really no value in trying to get it to the nearest um, foot or even tenths of feet. So I would round up to at least the nearest whole foot uh, radius, um, but often it's helpful to surround to the nearest five feet because uh, that's about the level of precision that you could get um, or that you should expect out of this methodology. All right, if we go to the next, If we go to the next curve along the path, we had a 144, so we're just gonna round that up to 145 foot radius. Now here, if the, if the circulatory roadway is still being sloped towards the outside for draining along the perimeter of the roundabout, we're now going to be in a negative super elevation environment here where the vehicle is curving against the cross slope. So here we're actually going to look at the negative super elevation speed, which would be 22 miles an hour. So we'll go ahead and mark that in as well. Oops. So 145 foot radius and a 22 mile an hour speed. And then on the exit, we had 460 foot. And again, this is, again, this is the radius that a geometry might allow but it's not necessarily going to be the actual speed since uh, we'll need to take into account some acceleration characteristics. In order to look at acceleration, we need to measure the distance that a vehicle might be accelerating over. And what we're gonna be looking at is the midpoint of the R2 curve. And I'm assuming that at about that point, the driver is going to start accelerating out of the roundabout. And so we wanna look at the distance from that midpoint to the crosswalk. So to measure that, one potential method is to use our V-spline again. We can snap to the middle of the R2, and then we'll use our nearest snap to just continue to follow our fastest path V-spline to the crosswalk. And then we can look at what the distance of that, the length of that B-spline was. In this case, it was about 153 feet. If we go back to our fastest path speed calculations, we'll see that 
in NCHRP report 672, there's another equation, equation 64, that provides the calculation method for converting these speeds and calculating what the potential speed might be at that crosswalk at the point of interest on the exit. This is also discussed in the appendix of the GDOT roundabout guide for reference. But the equation is fairly straightforward. It uses your starting speed, which is your 22 miles an hour uh, circulating speed in this case, your V2 speed. It has a assumed 6.9 foot per second acceleration. So that is going to be uh, a constant value that we're not going to change. And then we're looking at the distance. In this case, we had 153 feet that we measured, or 152 feet rather. Let's round to the nearest whole number. So this is giving us a speed of 38 miles per hour. Now, if we compare that, I'll get rid of our construction line there. If we compare that 38 mile an hour speed with acceleration against what we could achieve with the geometry, we're seeing that the geometry is actually driving the speed in this particular case. So you have a tight radius here, and while that radius is unfolding as part of the spiral, it's still small enough here with that negative cross slope that it is actually resulting in a slower speed. It's going to be uh, causing drivers to stay in a slower speed than if we were just taking into account uh, acceleration. So this is going to be the speed that we're going to be assuming that the drivers are going to be following based upon the geometry. That higher speed would be if the driver was leaving the R2 and was going into more of a tangent or more of a, a larger radius where uh, it was being unconstrained is where we might see that larger, faster 38 mile an hour speed come into play. So if we take a step back, we can look at the speeds for our overall path, our entering speed of 30 miles an hour and our circulating speed of 22 miles an hour are both within the, the uh, typical range that GDOT would like to see. Our exit speed of 33 miles an hour is getting a little bit higher. So one thing that we are, we're going to want to uh, pay attention to at this point is whether we have adequate stopping site distance from this kind of midpoint of the R2 to the crosswalk. So drivers that are circulating through the roundabout, making sure that they can appropriately see and have enough time to react and to yield to those pedestrians uh, on the crossing. Other considerations would be supplemental treatments for these crosswalks to further support speed control and pedestrian visibility and driver awareness of pedestrians at those locations uh, to support driver yielding. And those additional supplemental treatments are further discussed in the GDOT Roundabout Guide and other research documents for reference. I will uh, provide a overall summary of the speeds for the overall roundabout at the end of the video. But for now, we're going to move on to the final step, which is looking at the speeds for the right turns and the left turns. So I'll turn the offsets back on and turn off some of these labels. We'll first look at this right turn for the eastbound to southbound approach. We're going to use the same process with using our B-spline, setting three points upstream of our 165 foot reference line, one point along the outside curb line, and another three points to the south of our 165 foot reference line. Note that for this particular geometry, we've got pretty good uh, match with the offset lines through the entering point and the um, initial curve. But through the exit, our curve goes quite a bit over the curb line. And just a simple adjustment, a simple adjustment here isn't going to resolve that. We only have one point to adjust along the middle of the path. And if we try to adjust that to meet the exit, we're going to be inside the offset lines here. If you try to keep the offset points along the middle of the curve, we're going to be over along the exit. And really, this is the result of the geometry for this particular location. We've got a skew that is impacting the alignment of this exit. We've also got some spirals that are pushing the vehicles out further here and resulting in this um, set of curvature through the exit for this particular site. 
So in order to uh, resolve that, we're going to need to move the points for our exit further up. I'm going to make sure that we've got our near point snaps on. I'm going to move these closer. For any of our through paths, we always want to be using the 165 foot distances as our minimums for starting and ending the path. Uh, typically, you're going to have a flatter path for your exits as you go through the intersection. But for the right turns, unless you have a really big skew, um, you often have a little tighter curvature for the right turns. And so the point where your vehicles might be interacting with the curb line through those right turns might be a little bit closer like they are here. We also have this little bit of a curve coming around and about that point where the curve is tying into this tangent is where uh, this path is likely to need to bend uh, to match the curb line geometry. And so that's where I'm sticking my points along my fastest path is really to try to tie into where this tangent um, is set up along the curb line. Along the entry, if I move my points up just kind of barely here, I'm gonna end up with this little small kink in my path coming into the into the entry. So I'm actually going to leave the points beyond my 165 foot offset line on the entry here because that gives me a nice smooth curve coming into my right turn. So now it's just a matter of adjusting my path so that I'm hitting the two points of this curve trying to get that as close as possible, which it looks like about right there. Note that I'm not snapping to the line here because my middle point, actually I need to, I guess a little bit of a flat tangent through the entry for vehicle alignment. So I've got two points that I'm trying to uh, interact with. And so I'm just using that one point to try to make sure I'm just barely off that offset line at both of those locations. And then I'll come back to my exit here. Looks like I'm pretty close, but I need to, move that point up just a little bit further to make sure that I'm inside of that offset line. All right, so now we have a nice smooth path around the corner for that right turn. For the northbound approach here around the corner, we've got a, we'll follow a similar process and follow a path that uses both lanes. Similar here, we, fought, we crossed both lanes on the entry, but we only had one exit lane. Here, we're gonna have one entry lane, but it's gonna cross both exit lanes. We use the full width. So we'll start out again by using, oops, let's try that again. Snapping three points to our offset line on the uh, downstream side of our 165 foot reference line. One point at the uh, corner of the roundabout, and then we'll do three more points at the exit past our 165 foot reference line. And we'll use that as our starting point here and see how close this one's tying in. Straight tangent on the entry, straight tangent on the exit, and then a pretty simple curve around the corner here. So we should be able to get this one lined up a little bit easier than that other one was. I still need to move this out just a little bit further. And here it's kind of the same. We're ending up with pulling the path just a bit far where it's pinching on this corner here. So I'm going to move this back just a little bit to make sure that we're able to get this path so that it's meeting our offset line all the way around the corner. So I'm just kind of barely touching there just barely off there as well. So I can probably move just a little bit closer. Yeah, there we go. So we've got a path established for this one. We didn't have to move these points quite as close because it was more of a simple curve here. But because it's a simple curve, there's actually another method that we could look at as well to see if it might generate a faster path. And that's just using a simple arc. So if I use a simple arc, I'm gonna get a tangent snap, and we're just going to do a three point tangent snap. And I'm actually gonna to snap to this initial tangent upstream. I'm gonna snap a little bit closer to this tangent 
on the egg uh, on the exit side and then we can snap to our offset line here in the corner and I'm actually going to change the color here so we can tell the difference a little bit better we'll put this one to red so you can see that this line I'm maintaining my offsets if this trajectory that this vehicle was following next to the paint line continued. This is at the point where they would start to interact with that two foot offset from the curb face, since there's a little bit more of an offset here at the nose. And then they would curve back in and touch the offset right through the entry. But then through the exit, they're swinging a little bit tighter and starting their tangent closer to the roundabout through the exit. So this radius would be simple to measure. We can simply just look at what that arc radius was, which is about 150 feet. So I'll go ahead and label that. Let's see. So we need to do the speed calc before we can label it. Um, so if we have a 150 foot radius, that's gonna end up being a 24 mile per hour speed. We have the roadways sloping towards the outside curb line all the way through, uh, both on the exit and on the entry. So that curve is working with the uh, cross slope of the roadway, so it'd be positive. So we'd have 24 mile per hour speed. So we can go ahead and label that. Update the color here. For this other curve, we're going to have to measure the curve radii. So let's go in, I'm going to turn the offsets off so we can get in there a little bit tighter. And we'll set our circle to be able to measure that. So we'll get our 70 foot diameter circle and we'll kind of ballpark here along the path where it looks tightest. And I'm going to guess right about there is where we got the tightest path. So that ends up with a radius of about 100 feet. Now we could go a little bit to the south and check. It's 104, a little to the north. 104, so yeah, it looks like we're about the tightest point right there. So we're going to call that, we're just going to round that up to 105 feet. We were at 103 and change. So if we put that in here at 105, that ends up being a 21 mile per hour predicted speed. So that's the difference between those two methods. And I'll typically check both um, when we have just a simple curve like this, because I think it, it does make sense that a driver um, if given the chance, we'll try to go as fast as they can. And in this case, that simple curve will allow them to go a little bit faster around that corner. But in a lot of cases where you have more complex geometry like this, a simple curve just isn't gonna make sense. And so the, um, the beast spline method using that spiral curve is going to be the method that you want to use as kind of your default. But I'll go ahead and label this um, as well, just for reference, that was 105 and 25 miles per hour. Just double check, I got that, yep. So pretty big difference in speed being determined between the two. But given that this 
larger speed is the speed that actually would be allowed by the geometry. This is what I would use when evaluating the fastest path and showing that that would be the true fastest path for somebody going through and the fastest somebody that the geometry would allow. Going back to our first curve here, we can also measure it. And so if we copy our circle template, let me grab the right thing here. We can come over and find the tightest point of this curve, which is probably about there. And that gives us a radius of 140. We'll just do a quick double check on either side. That's 135. So actually, we'll need to move it over just a little bit. And try again. So that's 135. If we go a little bit further to the right, that's 134. So we're pretty close. Let me just check a little further upstream here. 144, so it's bigger. So I'm going to move it one more time, just a little bit further to the right. And we're going to call that good. Yeah, 130. Essentially, it's 135. We'll round up to 135. So in this case, we have a 23 mile per hour right turn. Again, roadway sloping to the outside through both the entry and the exit is what's being assumed for drainage. And so that curve is going with that cross slope. For right turns, we want a maximum fastest path speed of 25 miles an hour. And so both of these right turns meet that threshold regardless of which method we use to construct the fastest paths. The last step is to develop our left turn path. We turn back on our offsets. We can develop our B spline for this eastbound to northbound left turn. We'll start by setting three to four points in the vicinity of our 165 foot offset on the approach. We'll put one point along the outside curb line. And we typically put one point along the central island. We'll have to make an adjustment uh, for this and I will explain why momentarily, but we'll do one point for now. I'll put one point along the outside curb line on the exit and then we'll finish our path with three to four points along the exit. So note that with this layout, we end up with pretty long distance between our entry point and our exit point. And this one point along the central island for our V-spline ends up getting pulled pretty tight into a tight radius that does not follow our curb line offsets. Trying to manipulate this out further isn't going to give us uh, reasonable results. And trying to manipulate these points closer is also going to present some challenges in terms of trying to achieve reasonable results. So even if we start moving these around, we're still not meeting these offsets. So really what we're going to need to do is put at least one more and possibly two more points along the edge of the central island. Note that if you have a path where you're only touching a short distance of the central island, such as in this northbound direction or southbound direction, you're probably going to only be touching a shorter distance, you get by with two points. For the east-west direction, we're going to be following along a much longer distance. So we're going to use three points for the eastbound and westbound left turns due to that longer distance that we're traversing adjacent to the central island. So if we delete that and start over, we're going to put our points back on again along the approach splitter island. We'll put one point along the outside curb line. I'm going to put three points along the central island. We'll do one more point on the outside curb line on the exit, and then we'll finish our path with three or four points along the exit. 
So we'll come through like we did previously and check our offsets and make any adjustments that we need to to make sure that we're meeting our offset at all points. see that by putting in those couple of extra points, we're able to achieve a much better fit around the central island in order to be able to make sure that we're meeting those offsets at all points. Get through the exit here. So we're able to achieve a nice smooth path through the entry and around the circular roadway. Once we've got our left turn path developed, we can turn off our offsets and use our circle tool to place a 70 foot guide circle along the path at the tightest point. So we'll look somewhere right in there. And then using our arc tool, we'll measure minimum arc length of 65 feet along that path and we're getting a radius of about 75 feet using our speed radius equations 75 foot radius will get us an 18 mile an hour speed with a positive cross slope or a 17 mile an hour speed with a negative cross slope if we didn't have any additional information about our vertical design we could use 18 miles an hour as our assumed value to be conservative. However, for some of the other speed radius calculations in this demonstration, we've been assuming that the roadway slopes towards the outside curb line. In this case, the roadway would have a cross slope away from the central island. That's gonna result in a negative cross slope for a driver that's circulating around the central island. So for this example, we're gonna use a 17 mile an hour speed for our R4 for this westbound to northbound left turn. The next step would be to go through and complete all of our paths for our other movements, and then go through and finish measuring and labeling everything. We've gone through and done that already for the remaining paths. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn on all of the paths that we've created so far, as well as the labels that go along with the paths. And we're going to Take a moment to take a quick look through the various paths and see how this roundabout is performing. Starting with the north-south paths, we end up with a 23 mile an hour entry speed and 20 mile an hour R2 circulating speed. So we've got good entering and circulating speed control that are below our 25 mile an hour target. For the southbound approach, we similarly have 23 miles an hour and 20 miles an hour. So again, both northbound and southbound entry and circulating speeds are performing in the range that we would like them to. East-west, we've got 30 mile an hour entry speed. So right at our upper limit, that goes into a 22 mile an hour circulating speed for the through movement. Heading westbound, we have a 27 mile an hour entry speed. So a little tighter, a little slower coming into the westbound entry but then the geometry through the exit allows for a flatter path from there. We end up with a 27 mile per hour R2 across the top of this roundabout. So just the composition of the design in terms of how the entries and exits and structure roadway tied together allowed a little faster speed through the top of the roundabout than through the bottom. What that ends up meaning is that you're when we're starting with a little higher speed at the R2, as we're traversing towards the crosswalk through the exit, we're allowing a little faster speeds with acceleration towards that exit crosswalk compared to the other direction where we're starting out about five miles an hour slower. And so we're gonna end up with a lower potential speed at that downstream crosswalk. For our northbound and southbound exits, we're ending up with speeds in the range of 27 to 33 miles an hour. So again, a little higher than we'd like to see. There's a longer distance because of the size of this roundabout between the midpoint of the R2 and that crosswalk. So you're able to get a little bit more acceleration as you uh, approach those crosswalks. 
So for each of these multi-lane crossings, as well as for these faster single-lane crossings, these could be potential candidates for supplemental treatments to help reinforce driver yielding uh, and compensate for some of those slightly higher speeds. Around the circuitry roadway, we've got speeds of 17 miles an hour around the roundabout uh, at all points along the circuitry roadway. So overall, we're achieving speed entry speed controls that are within range. For some of our circulating speeds, we're getting maybe a little higher than we would like to see up here. Uh, so there could still be some opportunities for some additional iteration, additional refinement. But overall, most of the entering and circulating speeds are within range. Really, it's the exit speeds here that are slightly higher than we would like to see. And with that, that concludes the demonstration. For additional information, please refer back to the GDOT roundabout design guide. Appendix D provides additional step-by-step -step instructions on the paths that we've demonstrated today.